Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Token Post interview. Today we have invited Mr. Bobby Lee, the co-founder of BTCC and one of the board members of Bitcoin Foundation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so could you give a bit brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, so I uh, got into the Bitcoin space through my brother, Charlie Lee. He's famous for creating Litecoin. Mm -hmm. So that was in 2011. And uh, that's when I started mining Bitcoin myself. Mm -hmm. And also, and then starting in 2013, I joined up with my partners to launch uh, BTC China as a company. So when you started, uh, when you started as a miner in the first, yeah. like, how was it back then? It was great. It was actually summer of 2011. Mm -hmm. Started mining using the ATI graphics cards, ATI Radeon graphics cards, mm -hmm. GPU mining. I remember each, each card had a mining hash power of just 220 mega hashes <laughs> per second. So it was, uh, it was, you know, four cards in the PC. That's about 880 mega hashes, less than one giga hash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was excellent. It was fun days. And that would result to how many Bitcoins? In so I think I mined about 10 or tw I think 20 Bitcoins for the whole summer for the like four or five months. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, now moving on to the interview, uh, BTC China is the world's first, uh, well, China's first Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency exchange. Yes. Uh, it must have been hard to fight to achieve that since the Chinese government is taking a conservative perspective on cryptocurrencies. How did it all start? Well, I started in 2011, so, and by 2013, I, by 2013, I managed to work together with my two co-founders mm -hmm. to really bring BTC China, at the time it was called BTC China, mm -hmm. uh, into a sort of a more mature company with venture fundraising and also uh, to grow it globally, to launch global businesses. Mm -hmm. So that was through 2013, 14, 15, we did that. And of course, you know, over the years, over the last five years, the Chinese regulators have come in to, to you know, regulate <laughs> or crack down on Bitcoin a few times. Uh, ultimately, it ended up us uh, having to close BTC China Exchange oh, really? in September of 2017. Mm -hmm. But the BTCC business, which is the global business, that continued. It, was, it, it continued to have international mining pool, mm -hmm. uh, international exchange, and also, also the international mobile wallet. So that has continued to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, I know you must have heard this. Um, I mean, I've been asked this a million times. But when it comes to Bitcoin, uh, the publicity is divisive. Uh, recently, a Chinese billionaire said that the technology itself isn't a bubble. However, Bitcoin, economic, uh, economic wise, it is indeed involved in a bubble. So, what is your take on the statement that Bitcoin is indeed a bubble? Well, uh, sure, Bitcoin is a bubble, but so is everything else. Real estate is a bubble. Stock markets are in a bubble. Uh, the money system itself is in a bubble. Mm -hmm. So so something to be in a bubble is neither here nor there. To me, it's not what's interesting. What's interesting is Bitcoin is a way here. It's the way forward. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, just like the Internet 20 years ago, it's a one-way street, meaning that once we have Internet, it's going to be more pervasively used mm -hmm. by globally by everyone. Now, sure, some people still don't have access. The rich and the poor, there's a big divide. Same thing with Bitcoin. You know, today, very few people, mathematically speaking, very few people on Earth actually own Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. But over the, over the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, I am for sure confident that more and more people, there are going to be millions, hundreds of millions, even billions of users who will own cryptocurrencies. And the reason is very simple. Cryptocurrencies is an information-based asset. Mm -hmm. Anyone can own it. It's a very low barrier to entry, especially with increasing technology. Mm -hmm. So I don't care if the price is in a bubble. The price will continue to go up and go down. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is the future of our world in terms of money, commerce, and finances. Mm -hmm. It uh, doesn't have, by the way, it doesn't have to replace fiat money, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a meaningful percentage of all global assets. Previous to this interview, I was introduced to uh, Mr. Brock Pierce, the chairman of Bitcoin Foundation, and asked him the same question. Well, investors can indeed move their assets to pump up the transaction amount and confound some small-time investors lead to price manipulation. Do you believe that in the cryptocurrency world, that price manipulation of well investors indeed do exist? And also, is that the case in the Bitcoin community? So price manipulation is a hard thing to say. Just just in many markets, there is price manipulation. And I think it's a role for regulators mm -hmm. to define what it is, to identify it, and to prosecute people who are breaking the law. So for people, for a real estate developer or for a real estate business person to buy up 
many properties mm -hmm. is that manipulating the price of real estate mm -hmm. you know uh, same thing with stock you know if, if company owners buy a large percentage is that manipulating the price of a stock so it's a very it's a very touchy subject it's it's very blurry it depends on the local laws of the country and the regulators mm -hmm. so certainly there have been accusations that there are big traders out there buying and selling Bitcoin pumping the price up and selling the price down and especially with the futures market with with amplification in terms of uh, large sort of large um, hedging mm -hmm. so it, it's I guess it's normal for the course of business it's just a matter for the regulators to decide what is price manipulation what is allowed what is not allowed speaking of regulation uh, your presentation today is about uh, cryptocurrency in China yes and there's a lot of news coming out from China so how is the like vibe the atmosphere there the atmosphere so if, Within the circle, people who are in the industry, there's still a lot of activity going on, people buying and selling. Mm -hmm. It's just that now that the exchanges have closed down, it's harder for the new person, harder for the uninitiated to know how to buy, where to buy crypto. But for the people who know how to do it, they do it every day. They trade it every day. They, they trade ICOs. They participate in token sales. They do all that stuff. What's your take on the Chinese government on banning exchanges? Do you agree with that or do you support that or do you think there should have been a better you know, reaction? I think there are multiple ways to do it. It's too early for me to form an opinion what they should have done or what they could have done. Mm -hmm. But we know for sure that they've changed their minds multiple times. And I know for a fact that I predict nothing in China is permanent. Mm -hmm. So everything can have room to change to reverse course. Uh, what my, it could take five months, it mm -hmm. could take five years, it could take 50 years. Mm -hmm. But for sure, for sure, I think crypto trading in China will come back. Just like I know for sure the Chinese renminbi will be free-floating one day mm -hmm. uh, for the same reasons. In Korea, regulation, we also banned ICOs, you know, allow a part of it. Regulation is a hot topic everywhere in the world. Yeah. So in your perspective, what could be the ideal direction on when it comes to regulation? Um, th there's no easy answer for that. I think that the most important thing is governments and regulators need to understand that the rules and laws that they have in place today mm -hmm. in the law book is outdated. It doesn't take into, into account a world where there's a new digital asset that's information-based, where the asset can move from person to person, mm -hmm. from account to account, from company to company, instantly without any third parties involved. The traditional laws today, the regulatory laws today for the banking industry, for the payment industry, for the credit card and other payment service providers mm -hmm. are all assuming that money transfers require a third party. Mm -hmm. Whereas the future, in fact, the future is already here, the present. With crypto, people can move money without any third parties. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge difference. I'm not saying it means more regulation, less regulation. But what is true is the lawmakers and the regulators of every country need to come to that realization themselves. Many of them are old school. They don't understand this technology. They don't know what blockchain is. Mm -hmm. They don't know what decentralized currency means. They don't know what peer-to-peer -peer payments mean. Mm -hmm. But once they begin to understand that, it might even take a generation or two. Maybe young people like you, like in our world today, mm -hmm. the young folks, the teenagers the, in their 20s who know crypto at heart, mm -hmm. maybe one day they will grow up to be lawmakers and regulators in the government. And only then will the laws start changing mm -hmm. to be functional. Uh, I heard that it's your year off from your career. So <laughs> yeah. do you have any big plans in mind? or? Yeah, so I sold BTCC, got yes. acquired earlier this year. So I'm still staying on as an advisor. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I'm winding down the BTC China business. And then uh, we're doing, uh, basically, I'm doing a lot of speaking at conferences. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm playing some poker, so I want to play in the World Series of Poker mm -hmm. uh, tournament in Las Vegas mm -hmm. next week. The main event starts on Monday, mm -hmm. so I'll be there for that. Uh, <laughs> and I might start, start writing a book about Bitcoin later this year. Oh, really? Yeah. So when can the public explain? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a publisher yet, but I'm looking, <laughs> looking to write a book. So I'm curious to ask, yeah. as a poker player, Yes. Do you win a lot of money? Do you, uh, uh, how are your winning rates? I, I've won. I've won money in the past, but uh, I've played some tournaments. I won some tournaments. I've lost some tournaments. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a different game. Do you believe that your uh, well, hobby or maybe a career as a poker player you know, influenced you on getting into the whole crypto business? Um, I don't think poker directly affected crypto. I think my, my so me being an investor in gold, mm -hmm. so I was an investor, early investor in gold, 
uh, I think that helped me understand crypto mm -hmm. because gold, what is the value of gold? Gold's value is actually not, is actually just the physical properties of gold. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that gold can be, has stable properties to make it a good store of value. Mm -hmm. So uh, understanding Bitcoin's value, the value of Bitcoin comes in its properties. In this case, it's the digital electronic properties of Bitcoin. So that's what makes it valuable. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, uh, how, is it okay if I ask how much Bitcoin do you own? <laughs> you well, if, if you know this industry, actually people don't talk about that. Yes. People don't ask that, people don't talk about that. <laughs> I have more than one, I have less than a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of expecting the same answer. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason people don't ask is because there's no way to prove it, there's no way mm -hmm. to disprove it. And you know, we all wish we had more, we all wish we had purchased more, but the reality is no one ever has enough. Uh, yesterday, we had a panel discussion regarding the future of exchanges. Yeah. And you being the co-founder of the Chinese first crypto exchange. Nowadays, there are very you know, diverse types of exchanges, hybrid, decentralized, centralized. Where do you see the future of exchanges going? The uh, future of exchanges, I think, is more regulation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, countries will compete for exchanges to be hosted in their countries. I, mm -hmm. think, I think even fiat money will compete for exchanges because... The country that embraces crypto exchanges will see their fiat money become very popular. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be bridge currencies, just like BTC and ETH are bridge currencies for the crypto world. Mm -hmm. There will be certain currencies, fiat currencies, that will be bridge cur currencies for the fiat world. Today it's US dollar, Euro, and another currency can emerge as a third currency to be the bridge currency. So uh, I think that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. But of course there's gonna be more regulation, more laws, more rules. Uh, but that's how the world is today. It's unpredictable what, whether the future is going to go. Yeah. <laughs> so do you plan to stand, uh, stay off investing during your time off? Or do you have any future plans that you are currently looking into or when it comes to investing? Uh, so I, I invest in a variety. I invest in real estate. I invest in stocks. Uh, I've made small sort of angel investments in the companies as well. Mm -hmm. uh, some crypto, some non-crypto. So I keep my eyes open in terms of how to diversify and make new investments. Then in your definition, what could be the ideal project and the ideal use of blockchain? Uh, you know, I'm actually quite pessimistic on how blockchain has been used lately. Mm -hmm. I think many companies and projects out there are misusing blockchain mm -hmm. because blockchain, in my mind today, the only successful use case of it is as a, as a cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. People who use blockchain for real world activities uh, many of them are, are, are not suitable for blockchain because mm -hmm. in the end, if they use it like a database, mm -hmm. then that's quite a waste mm -hmm. because in my mind, blockchain and a database is very different. Just like uh, uh, you could consider blockchain a type of database, mm -hmm. but if you're using a blockchain generically as a traditional database that's been around since the 1980s and 90s, mm -hmm. then that's not innovative. It's, I'm not saying it's bad, but mm -hmm. it's not blockchain innovation. It's just database innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're here as the co-founder of BTCC and taking part in our blockchain open forum and giving a speech on how the cryptocurrency works in China. Uh, can we expect to see you in blockchain 2019 as an author? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking to write a book, so we'll, we'll see when, that, when that's done. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> so do you mind giving any last comments to our audience? Okay. So hi, everyone in Korea. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, it's been a few years since I've been back to Seoul, to South Korea. And I love the enthusiasm of the community here. I think it's great that Korea is such a vibrant country. We're so passionate about crypto. So good luck, everyone, and hope you guys make a lot of money and make great investments in Bitcoin and blockchain. <laughs> Mr. Lee, thank you so much for your time and as well as the keynote speech at our event. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. That was Mr. Bobby Lee, the co-founder of BTCC. Thank you. Thanks.